reading research articles can be really hard if you are new to the field. In another video I talked about the importance of understanding the concepts and understanding the theories that link those concepts when you read an article. In this video I'll take a look at how you can use the structure of a research article to, to guide your reading and maybe uh, the structure will help you to be more efficient so that you don't have to read every part of the article to understand it and also more effective so that you will understand uh, the ideas on a deeper level than uh, just skimming through the article would give you. Articles are not read like novels. So novels would be read from the beginning to the end and you would process progress sequentially. Articles are not read that way. So if you are trying to read it from the beginning to the end, you are doing it wrong. When I read an article, depending of course what's the purpose of the reading, I might spend 15 minutes on the article to get the main point and then move to the next article. Or if I'm evaluating the article, if it's done right or not, then I might spend three or four hours on the article. If I just want to know what the article is about, I might spend two minutes on it. So how much time you read on the, uh, read the article and, and what, which part of the article you read depends on it, what is the purpose of you reading that article. This is a typical structure of a research article. So we have introduction which tells uh, what is the, the article about, why it might be interesting, why it might be important, and typically you also find the research question here. Then we have literature review or some kind of theory part which uh, typically contains citations to previous research but often also expresses new ideas. Like we have the article by Sapienza that I use as an example and in that article the authors claim that early international expansion increases the risk of failure but it also increases the, prob uh, the probability of growth and the theory part of the article explains the author's reasoning on why they think that is the case. The theory part contains the explanation of the causal mechanism. Then we have data and methods and I will not go in, uh, in detail what that includes because it depends a lot on the type of article but typically you would have an explanation of what, what data were used, where it was companies, was it people, was it a quantitative or a qualitative study, how the data were analyzed and so on. Then we have the results section where we uh, explain whether or how we think that the data either support or refute some idea that we present in the article. The discussion section then starts from, takes the results and then explains what do those results mean. So uh, why would somebody care about those results? Do they have some policy implications? Do they have some implications for research? And so on. And then we have conclusions, which is typically sort just focuses on, on the interesting and importance of the article and uh, typically one page or so just telling what to do next. A former colleague of mine, Mikko Jaskelainen, told me that this structure follows what he calls master's thesis wave. And this also applies to master's thesis, of course, as the name implies. The idea is that in the introduction, you start from a very high level of abstraction. You focus on, on big picture, you, you have high level concepts. And then when you go to the theory and the literature review, then you start to explain the causal mechanism. And then uh, you go into the nitty gritty detail on what exactly happens and why. The same with methods, there's lots of detail. And then uh, when you start discussing the results and particularly when you go to the conclusion, you increase the level of abstraction as well. So why is understanding this useful? It is useful because sometimes understanding the big picture is enough. So if you just want to understand the big picture of what the article says, then typically reading the introduction, discussion and conclusions might be sufficient if the article is well written. Now, let's take a look at how we actually read articles. So reading an article, how you do it is not from beginning to the end, but instead you start, <coughs> you, you are kind of like, asking the article questions. So you're looking answers to questions from the article. And uh, there are some steps. The first step that you need to do is the first question that you need to ask is what is the topic and what is the research question? Typically the answer is found in the introduction. 
once you have that covered, so you read the introduction, you might need to read it many times over if it's poorly written, but typically one read is enough to understand this topic, so you, this question. So you don't move on reading uh, before you understand what is the topic and what is the research question. Reading beyond the, the introduction, if you don't understand those two things, uh, would be a big waste of time. The next thing is uh, identifying the key concepts and the theory that links those concepts. I have another video about the concepts and theories, but ideally if there is this kind of boxes and arrows diagrams, the boxes are the concepts, the arrows are the causal relationships that the article proposes or tests, then uh, you would have to understand what are the boxes. So how do we define fungibility for example? What does it mean that there's manager experience? What is our initialization of internalization process? And so on. Uh, so you look for a diagram, you look for the boxes and explanations for the boxes. So you identify the concepts and you identify the propositions that explain the causal relationships between those concepts. Okay, once you've understood the theory, the next question that you ask is what are the data? So uh, what research design and data are used? I'm not talking about that you would go on and look like so what flavor of, of uh, grounded theory is being applied or or what kind of regression analysis or generalized linear model or something is applied but just more on a higher level like uh, is it a study of people or is it a study of companies and if it's people what kind of people was it students was it people uh, who are working startups was it executives in large companies? Just understand where do the data come from? It does not take uh, much understanding of research methods to understand what the data are. Then you need to also understand what is the research design? Was it interviews? Was it survey? Was it archival data? Or was it perhaps experiment? And uh, this is the level of understanding that you need to have to understand the main idea of the article. Then if you want to evaluate if the article is, if the claims are valid and how strong the claims are, then you need to look, go and look deeper. But normally just looking at what's the research design, what is the sub sample is sufficient. Then uh, main results and what it means, typically you might skim through the results section because that basically provides the evidence behind the results and then the results are typically stated again in the, in the discussion section. So the discussion is the next main focus. So you would focus less on this data and methods and results part and more on the discussion because it explains the results unless you want to evaluate how well the article is done. Okay. <clears throat> Now, there's another thing beyond the macro structure, the big structure of the article that you need to understand that if you understand this, it may it'll make you a better reader of academic research articles. The idea is the understanding the micro structure. So uh, an article is a set of paragraphs. So the paragraph is the basic unit of composition. This is an important idea for those also who write master's thesis and want to have a higher grade, understand that one idea one paragraph, if you have two ideas, then you split it into two paragraphs. If we understand this, then we understand that once we have read the paragraph and if we get the main idea, then we can proceed to the next paragraph. The paragraph itself has a structure as well. Let's take a look at this <clears throat> paragraph, uh, the introduction section of uh, uh, Sapiens's article, it is four pages, 15 paragraphs. That's quite a long introduction because it also explains the theory as well. So how do we go about making sense of this all? Well, we, we do make a sense of it all by understanding the structure of the paragraph itself. Now this is something that people don't usually cover on research methods courses, but I find this a very useful thing to understand. So in, in a well-written paragraph, there are three kinds of sentences. You have the opening sentence here, which gives the topic. So this is the first sentence of the paragraph. It tells that the early internalization of startups challenges traditional theories of internalization. If you know those traditional theories, good. If you don't know, well, you understand that, that startups are something that prior theory does not explain really well. And then there is the conclusion sentence which says that studying these startups might give us new insights that the existing theory, existing empirical evidence does not. So this is called the concluding sentence. And uh, 
anything between is supporting sentences. So we have the, conclu the topic sentence which tells what this paragraph is about, and then we have the concluding sentence which gives us the conclusion of that paragraph. Everything else is supporting the conclusion starting from the topic. So why is this useful to know? Well, here is my pro tip. If you want to quickly understand a part of an article, don't read the supporting sentences. There are some exceptions, but focus on the topic sentence, focus on the concluding sentence, and then uh, don't read anything between here. So between here is simply just a, a explanation of some prior internalization theories, but the topic sentence already said that uh, they don't explain startups, startup really, startups really well, and if we don't want to go into detail in understanding which specific theory does not explain this well, then we don't actually need to read any of that stuff. So just read the first sentence and the last sentence and see if we can, if you can make, uh, get the main point of the paragraph from just those two sentences. Now, there's a caveat. This applies only to well-written articles. So uh, some articles that you read might be really difficult to read because they are really poorly written. And uh, this is something that I, I often like to complain as a reviewer, that many articles just have loads and loads of text to express a simple idea. So a simple idea should be expressed in a short form and one idea, one paragraph, instead of, of paragraphs that might be uh, two pages long, which I've also seen. That's, that's horrible writing. Then the blame is on the author, not on the reader. So, but this article is well written, so we can apply this rule of thumb of reading the, the topic sentence and the conclusion sentence to understand what the introduction is about. Let's apply it. So, paragraph one <clears throat> tells us that uh, early internalization of startups challenges prior theory on international expansion, therefore studying starts up startups is useful because it can open up, up new uh, avenues for theory. So they're basically saying that startups are something that existing theory does not explain, therefore we should study them. And that's the point of the first paragraph. Once we understand the point, the main idea, one idea per paragraph, we move on to the second paragraph. So the second paragraph has only three sentences. And uh, because it's only three sentences, we don't save uh, a lot of time and effort uh, by, by omitting the, the middle paragraph. And these short paragraphs you probably should read in full. And, and this is particularly important here because they tell that they have a framework where they apply the concept of capabilities and the concept of dynamic capabilities and they give definitions. So if we have a marker at hand, now it would be a good time to underline these definitions and write to the margin that in this part of the article you will find definitions for some of these, these key concepts. So this is about definitions and it's about uh, giving the key concepts. Then the third paragraph, uh, <clears throat> they say that they build on the idea of imprinting and they explain that the idea of imprinting is uh, that, that what you do early on has long-lasting consequences. And then uh, they say that early internalization uh, has been proposed that it affects later growth, but then again, this has not been uh, explained in detail. So the idea here is that they uh, apply the concept of imprinting to extend uh, a previously presented idea. This is the point of the third paragraph. Then the fourth paragraph, this is a bit longer one, and in here we have lots of citations, so we, this is more of, a supporting, more of supporting evidence for this paragraph, so maybe not worth reading. And uh, the paragraph says that the early part of firm internalization process provides an interesting context in which to study the development of capabilities, and then they say that they in integrate various prior theories. So what those prior theories are, if we want to uh, focus more on this paper, we might go to the detail, but just it's enough if we want to get the big idea that this paper integrates various different theoretical perspectives. We don't necessarily need to understand what those are to understand the main idea. Now, another interesting uh, important thing to note is when there is a change of topic within a section. So this introductory section uh, has been focusing on, on, on general terms. So they talk generally why studying startups is important and they study why 
or what studying startups enables them to do, but they have not presented any specific claims yet. They have presented some concepts, but no specific claims. And now they go and, and they, they start explaining their, their specific uh, claims. So when you identify this kind of switch of theme within section, then it's a good idea to stop and think about, have I understood there are uh, the previous paragraphs within this section, this introduction, well enough that I can proceed further? Or should I go back and perhaps revisit one of these first four paragraphs? We'll continue. And uh, then again, three sentence paragraph, they say that they advance two main claims. And uh, the first claim, extending Autio's prior research, Autio is a co-author in this article, they claim that uh, early internalization leads to learning advances and therefore early internalization expansion early on can help you to grow much quicker than what you would otherwise do. So that's the, that's the first main claim. And then uh, the second claim that they do is that uh, they point out that in previous study by Autio, it did not look at the possibility that early international expansion might actually hurt the company, make it less likely to survive because international expansion uh, takes resources which the young company might not have. And uh, then they uh, address the timing of the, uh, of the uh, how the timing of international expansion affects the capabilities and resources and uh, how that affects survival. So that's their, uh, their second uh, idea. So they think that it enables companies to grow, but it also affects survival if you expand internationally uh, as a young company. Paragraph seven is, uh, talks about the relationship between growth and survival. So that is the topic sentence. And then uh, there's some research cited here. We don't need to understand the specifics, but we look at the conclusion the research demands of growth are cha uh, challenges that if survived may make a firm, your firm uh, stronger, yet many will be unable or unwilling to develop the dynamic capabilities required. So if you try to expand internationally early on, that will help you to grow, but it also increases the risk of failure. That's the main point of this paragraph. Paragraph eight, paragraphs eight and nine are basically supporting paragraphs for paragraph seven. And they just say that uh, relationship between growth and survival is complex. So it's not studied much within this context. And uh, I would read all these two paragraphs together because this is a single sentence paragraph. And those are typically best understood within the context of the preceding or the next paragraph. So that is paragraphs eight and nine. And uh, what we will note now is that they have advanced, uh, they also now switch to uh, a different theme again. So in these paragraphs between about five and nine, they argued that early international expansion has a positive effect on growth because of imprinting and developing dynamic capabilities but it has a negative effect on survival because not all firms are able to do so and therefore they fail. And now they move on to another topic. So they uh, decrease the level of abstraction and they look at uh, these two mechanisms. So would there be other factors that affect the magnitude of these uh, mechanisms? And they, uh, they say that we posit that age and internalization and monetary experience, experience and research fungibility moderate the impact of internalization or probably of survival and growth. Okay, there is a term moderate. How, how do we know what that means? That term has a specific meaning. I know uh, based on my training that that meaning is that uh, you have uh, one, one variable that affects the magnitude of the effect of another variable on a third one. So that's moderation. So mo it's kind of like you, it, it strengthens or weakens. weakens. That's the, the meaning of the term moderates. Uh, if you don't understand that term, then you need to go to the research methods course because it's kind of assumed that you would understand this kind of terminology when you read the articles. There are a few terms that you need to know, and this is one of them. Because if you give moderate to Google, then Google gives you a definition that relates to, uh, to moderation within the context of, uh, let's say, uh, forum posting when someone is, is moderating if a posting is allowed to go through or not. 
And uh, this is the three sentence paragraph, then uh, we should probably read it. The idea is that resources and capabilities determine survival, and then uh, this uh, uh, expands the arguments from prior research. Paragraph 11 is uh, a short one, just two sentences. We read it fully. So the idea is that the younger the firm, when it expands internationally, the stronger the effect on growth and the stronger uh, the effect of, on, on survival. And this is the conclusion uh, that they have. So the younger, uh, if, you internationalize, uh, if you expand internationally uh, early on, then the imprinting effect is larger. You have uh, more capabilities that you develop, you grow faster. But on the other hand, if you start early on your international expansion, you have less resources, therefore the risk of failure is higher. The next paragraph is uh, the next um, claim. So we can now see that there is one paragraph for one of these moderators. So the first one was age at international expansion. And the second uh, uh, claim is that uh, increasing managers uh, or having managers with experience from prior uh, international expansions will uh, make the effects on growth stronger and effect on survival weaker. So the negative effect on survival is weaker, the positive effect of growth is stronger. So that's what they claim. And uh, they, they explain here in the final sentence that the mechanism for that is that the managers bring routines. So routines are ways of doing things within an organization. And, uh, that, and the routines are the mechanism. If you read the supporting sentences, you would uh, see that uh, the concept of routines come from Nelson's and Winter's book from 1984, 82, but you don't necessarily need to know that to understand what is the main point. So managers bring routines and routines help you to, uh, to, to uh, uh, develop capabilities. Paragraph 13, finally, is about uh, resources and resource fungibility. So uh, they explain uh, fungibility again, it was explained before, and uh, it's explained here because that might be something that the reader might not know. So the idea of fungibility as they explained is that you can take a resource and repurpose it for other purposes. So for example, if you, uh, if you hire people with general skills, then those are fungible because you can also use them in the, uh, in the markets where you operate currently, but if you hire people with specific skills, like you have, uh, you want to expand to China, and uh, you hire people whose main language is Chinese, but they don't know much Finnish, then they would be, not be of much use to the company if the expansion to China fails and the company just to stay in Finland. So that's uh, an example of non-fungible uh, resource. And uh, they say that the fungibility, they, they use it because they think that it's independence of company size. So, okay. And now we have uh, a three uh, another paragraph that says that these three moderators are basically independent, so uh, they, can, uh, they can be studied together. Fungibility is related to the age, somehow they explain that, but they can be studied as independent entities. So that's the main point of the paragraph, which you get from reading the first sentence and the last sentence. And then there is another uh, change of topic. So, uh, now we can see that the, the previous uh, group of paragraphs talked about these, what they call moderators. And before we proceed, it would be important that, uh, that we understand the argument behind each moderator, each of those three, what they are, what is the argument. Once we understand that, we can proceed uh, to the final paragraph, which is simply saying that uh, here is the complete model. Now, how nice of them to provide this kind of diagram which summarizes the claims of the paper. And then uh, they say that uh, in the next section, in the theory section, they develop uh, these uh, propositions uh, further and explain the reasoning, explain the causal logic uh, behind each of these, uh, these arrows. So that is how you would read the introduction part of this paper using this technique of focusing only on the topic sentence and the conclusion sentence, except if it's a short paragraph in which case you read it fully. And uh, to summarize how to read and understand articles that present theory, so or how do you understand an article that presents theory and data, that's also an article that presents theory, you first focus on uh, identifying the central concepts. There are typically a few, not all are, are 
uh, boxes. Some of these concepts might be the arrows, like dynamic capabilities and imprinting. They are part of the arrows, they are the mechanisms. Then you find the definitions. And uh, you use the structure of the article to do that. So uh, the definitions are almost always found in either the introduction or the theory section. And the definition of a concept, it's, the concept is almost always mentioned in the introduction sentence. So you can just go through the introduction sentences and, or the topic sentences and look where do I find that uh, concept being discussed, then I probably find the definition there. So understanding the structure will make you more efficient and more effective reader.